He's the former commander of British forces in Afghanistan. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us once again, Richard. Um, look, we've seen this uh, incursion into Gaza yesterday. Um, it was for a brief period. Um, the tanks went in. The tanks have rolled back out again. It's a tiny, tiny little uh, uh, bit of what we're going to see from what Benjamin Netanyahu says. He says he's not going to say when, he's not going to say how, but that invasion will be happening. Do you think that Benjamin Netanyahu is right to plan and to be looking ahead to a ground invasion of Gaza. And what do you think it will achieve? I think he's got little choice apart from to launch a ground invasion. Uh, the IDF for the last two, nearly three weeks now, have been battering Hamas from the air to do as much damage as they can from the air. While on the ground, the IDF have been preparing operations to launch armour, infantry, artillery into Gaza to deal with what can't be dealt with from the air. Their objective is to uh, annihilate Hamas effectively, which means either killing them or driving them out of Gaza, one of the two. Um, and, it, and it can't be done entirely from the air. So I think a ground incursion is necessary. Uh, and of course, you know, one of the considerations, there are many considerations in this, one of which is to do the maximum damage from the air before you expose ground troops to a, what's going to be a tough fight. And secondly, of course, looking at those hostages, doing whatever can be done to try and either rescue the hostages or some of them or have them released. So it's a complicated equation, which also includes what's going on up in the north in the, on the Lebanese border with the Iranian yeah. proxy Hezbollah. Um, it's an incredibly complicated picture. Many are saying, we understand you, the US and probably Britain as well behind the scenes are urging delay um, and, you know, a bit more control perhaps uh, than the Israelis would like to, to show on this um, because they fear that actually this will mean that they won't get the hostages back safely. Some some talk that Qatar, we know, involved with dealing with the leaders of, uh, of Hamas, happily living in the lap of luxury in Qatar, by the way, not uh, dealing with the realities on the ground in Gaza, um, that some like, possible release of some 50 hostages. Now, while that's on the cards, that will be, there'll be a lot of pressure on the Israelis to delay. There's also pressure from the US military. They want to bring in defense, air defenses for their military resources in the region, which they feel will come under attack. And indeed, for the embassies as well, already been under attack as a result of, of what's happened. Um, but at the end of the day, for the Israelis, surely the argument is the longer we delay, um, the more Hamas can prepare uh, for the ground uh, attack. And and the longer we still face this threat from Hamas, with rockets still being fired into Israeli territory, uh, putting the lives of Israeli civilians at risk. And, and they've got a very, very different, I suppose, weighing of the scales in terms of the calculations they're making. I think that's true. And, and um, <clears throat> obviously a high priority for Israel is the hostages that are held in Gaza at the moment. That's got to be a, a high priority, but I don't think it's going to stop them at the point that the IDF believe, or the Israeli government believe, that en enough has been done in terms of negotiations over hostages, then I think they will launch anyway, even if a significant number of hostages remain in Gaza. Yeah. And of course, Hamas is using these hostages as a weapon against yeah. Israel. Hamas is under immense pressure from the IDF from the sky, and they know they're going to come under even more pressure from the, from the ground. And so they're, you know, they're, they're desperately using these hostages to try and deter Israel from launching a ground offensive. I, I wouldn't imagine that that will work. Although it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's in some ways a game of nerves because, of course, there'll be pressures on Israel from countries like the United States and the UK to do what they can to get the hostages out, which, of course, the IDF want to do as well. But the longer, the longer the delay is, of course, in some ways, the more difficult it becomes. You mentioned the extra time it gives some math to prepare, that's a factor. And other factors, of course, are the, the building up that we've seen in the media, in the United Nations, other places, uh, against Israel's uh, potential ground offensive. And the longer it's drawn out, the more difficult that all becomes. And these are facts, you know, the, the, the US in particular is extremely important for Israel, yeah. and Israel can't really afford to, to disregard uh, political, certainly, the, you know, President Biden's view from the United States in its calculations. Well, indeed, the Israelis always talk about how they have this small window of sympathy where they're allowed to act, and then they're told, no, that's enough now, in, in a way that perhaps no other country is told to act. Let's, let's talk about the calls for ceasefire. 
uh, because we're facing that. We're going to be talking a few moments about sort of battles within the Labour Party about this. When people say there should be a ceasefire or the words are used by the Prime Minister, you know, a, 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 a pause in, in, uh, in the, the airstrikes and in any action, who benefits from that? Well, the clear beneficiaries of that are Hamas. And of course, everyone, any, any decent right-thinking person has huge sympathy for the Palestinian civilians, whether they're in North Gaza or South Gaza, or wherever they are. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's a potential for, obviously, for them to benefit from humanitarian aid coming in, and that's already begun. But I don't think a ceasefire um, is an, a necessary part of that. I think the only people that benefit from a ceasefire would be Hamath, and of course, that's what they want to do. Now, you... um, and, and I think the IDF would be, I mean, the IDF don't need my advice on this, but if I was to be asked for it, I would say do not go down the lines of a ceasefire. Keep on the pressure against Hamas. Destroy as much of it as you can. Move in as quickly as you can, while also doing everything you can to preserve the life of innocent civilians. Thank you. Very interesting to hear that. I mean, you, you were the commander of British forces, as we said, in Afghanistan. Uh, you've, you've you know, uh, taken part in urban warfare. We know very, very different from any other kind of warfare. Uh, striking buildings from a, a plane up high is very, very different from, you know, almost, you know, you know tank combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat in a city, in a built-up area. We see the images of Gaza and you know, the destruction is extraordinary. But we know that many of the people who are dying are civilians. Uh, many of the people who are surviving will be mi Hamas uh, militants because they are hiding underground in this huge, vast network, uh, London underground-sized network of tunnels that cost you know, hundreds of millions of, of dollars to build. Um, how would the Israeli uh, its defence forces go about tackling that issue? How will they go about getting into the tunnels and fighting in the tunnels, which would no doubt be labyrinthine and booby-trapped throughout? Well, it's... it's, it's... Like all of this, it's a very tough situation for them. And yes, a large number of civilians, I'm sure, have died so far as a result of the air attacks. Uh, I, I don't have any idea how many. The idea of claim they've killed a large number of Hamas fighters. Of course, we're hearing from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Health Ministry that everyone that's dying is a civilian, which, yeah. is, which clearly is not the case. Um, and when the troops go in on the ground, in some ways, there is a greater risk to civilians because airstrikes, though they may not seem it, they, they're, they're, they can be precision, they are precision directed against specific Hamas targets. Troops on the ground, tanks, artillery, infantry soldiers fighting on the ground is a much more blunt instrument. And don't forget, you know, the air, air power is pretty much invulnerable. There's not much threat to them there is a very direct threat to Israeli soldiers on the ground and they have to balance the, the protection of civilian life with the protection of their own lives as well. Yeah. When it comes to the tunnels, the IDF have been deliberately striking buildings where tunnels, where, where tunnel exits and entries are under. And so that hopefully has dealt with a significant amount of the tunnels in terms of not being able to get in or out of them. But then when it comes to ground operations, there'll be a need probably for, for some IDF troops to enter those tunnels and certainly for them to destroy them using explosives on the ground with yeah. IDF combat engineers. It's it's a really, you know, you mentioned, you said it yourself, urban combat is probably the most dangerous yeah. and, and casualty intensive form of warfare. And that's what they're about to face. Absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, that's what we expect coming days, weeks. Um, no doubt we will talk to you again.